Tonight we're going to talk about breaking away from the shackles of Egypt. We're going to be in the fifth chapter of Exodus. If you want to turn over there. <clears throat> Paul wrote and said, oh, I believe we're in the Corinthian letter, one of the Corinthian letters, he wrote and said that the Old Testament stories and records are given for our example, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth have come. And if we're not closer to the end times than any other generation has ever been, I don't know when it would be. We are standing very close to crisis time, and even those who used to be so optimistic in Pollyannia are now saying there's doom in the gloom in the wings. And the only real hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. Uh, when you once begin to grasp this truth, it will revolutionize your thinking and will cause you to have a new look in your whole being. You know, uh, I'm going to tell a little something on Randy. I think he's back there somewhere hiding, but uh, he spoke last night. He came here about a year ago, and uh, he was seeking um, the main reason he came here and he prayed that the Lord would transfer him here was because of deliverance, because he had been driven to desperation. Some of you know his testimony by the word faith message and the manifest sons of God and a bunch of other uh, equally garbagey type things. And uh, he came here seeking help and he has received help and continues to receive help. Uh, by the way, he's not completely delivered. Matter of fact, I'm not either. Uh, matter of fact, you're not. <laughs> we just might be even further down the track than some of, the, some of you are. But at any rate, uh, you're not going to meet somebody that's completely delivered. A lot of times we have people come here, you know, and they say, well, I want prayer, but I want the person that prays for me to, uh, to be completely clean and delivered. I said, well, you have to go somewhere else. <laughs> they say, What? I said, well, I can't. Well, can't you pray for me? I said, well, what are you talking about? I still have some demonic problems. <gasps> and they look at me so startled, you know. Well, they should talk to my wife. <laughs> or, or talk. <laughs> well, what an ugly laugh that was. <laughs> you see, you don't really have to go far until you know that all of us are not perfect. We're beginning to be. We're in the process of becoming. We have not arrived. A lot of people who think they've arrived really stink up the place because they're so filled with self-righteousness and everybody can see it except them. But at any rate, uh, just remember that deliverance is the answer. Uh, when I started to tell you about Randy, he came here and we force-fed him a lot of stuff. I mean, he's, he's a fast reader, so we really fixed him up. We, we shot the books and things to him to help him speed up. And then uh, here a while back, we decided he was ready for a little stronger diet, and we shot him some information on the Illuminati. He came into my office like this. He said, I said, what's the matter? He said, I'm in a state of shock. He said, I read this book last night. Good Lord. He said, I knew everything was bad. I knew it was terrible. But said, there's nothing left. He said, when? If we don't have deliverance, there's nothing. I said, really? <laughs> I was so surprised to find that out, you know. But it really is true, people. When you really get a perspective on what's going on, what ha has happened, is happening, and is proposed to happen, unless deliverance breaks the back of the enemy, there isn't any power on earth that can stop what's going on. It can't even slow it down. You're not going to have these religious circuses do anything to slow down the march of the enemy. It's going to take wrestling with powers, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions. Does that just kind of get a little sparkle in you? I felt somebody said, mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you've got to get over that, you see. You've got to get over your fear of those things and realize that we are the people of God and we're to attack. You hear a lot of people, we're the children of God. We're king's kids. Prove it. Throw that demon out over there. Let me see you do it. 
Well, I'm a manifested son. I'd like to see some of them manifest so we can get it out of them. <laughs> well, now you know they, why they say Worley is so contentious, you know. He's just hard to get along with. We're going to talk about the shackles of Egypt. And truly, you know, the children of Israel went into Egypt under stress and pressure. And they were forced to go there because of hunger and famine. And you remember how God had prepared a way because the devil intended to wipe the whole race out. But they were marked of God to be the Messiah's line. And of course, once again, the devil was <laughs> outmaneuvered. He tried to kill off Joseph and God used Joseph to deliver the whole family. You remember the story. Well, they ended up in Egypt and they were doing fine. They were supposed to go there and sojourn and as soon as things got better, they were to go home. But it was so nice in Egypt. It was lovely. There were so many good jobs there. And they had such lovely homes. And, and they had the favor of the king. And, and Joseph was there. And, and it was just lovely. And yeah, we, yeah we, we're going to go back over there. One of the, yeah, we'll go back home one of these days. One of these days we'll go. One of these days, one of these days. And suddenly, Joseph died. And there arose another Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, who could care less about what Joseph had done for Egypt. And he moved into the position of the sun god, Lucifer himself. You know that's what the Pharaoh was? He was, the, he was called the son of the sun god, and he was the uh, in, incarnation of the sun god. And any time you have halos or lights behind people, all that is, is that's Lucifer's sign. Did you know that? And here you thought they were holy because they had that little ring floating over their head. No, that just indicates Lucifer. Sun. He is the one who's called the sun god. In every mythology, there's a sun god. In Egyptian mythology, the Pharaoh was the kingpin. He was the sun god. And there was all kinds of magic and witchcraft. Egypt was riddled with powerful satanic witchcraft. You'd, you'd expect that with their ruler being worshipped as the sun god, as the very epitome of God on earth. He was the vicar of Christ. Oh, he didn't live at Rome, did he? But he, he made pretensions to the same things. He was God on earth. He was God's voice on earth. And therefore, he had absolute power of life and death over all his subjects. And there was idolatry, widespread idolatry. Many gods in Egypt, they worshipped everything under the sun. And then some. The ten plagues of Egypt were directed to destroy the gods of Egypt. Against all the gods of Egypt have I executed judgment. And every one of those ten plagues was aimed at something the Egyptians worshipped. And when God got through their gods, were so, they were so sick of their gods, they puked every time they thought about them. I mean, God stuck their gods down their throat till they said, no more, no more. They worshipped the Nile River and they got to where they couldn't stand the sight of it. It turned to blood. Remember? No, they worshipped cows. And they turned out to be a real thing. They worshiped frogs. So God gave them millions of frogs. So they covered up with frogs. And then when he finally took them away, they all died and stunk up the place. You mouth, can you imagine big piles of frogs, big as a house out there, stinking? I just want you to see the picture. God hated the gods of Egypt. It was a place of idolatry. It was a place filled with greed and covetousness. It was filled with lust and incest because the Pharaoh, uh, the prince, always married his sister. And so incest was prevalent, encouraged. There was arrogance, pride, there was cruelty, there was no compassion, no mercy. And there was, they depended of, on the arm of flesh. Egypt was a powerful nation. There was hard-heartedness and un injustice. There was an abuse of power. Now what a lovely place to live. Egypt became from being a lovely place to be and the refuge God had prepared is when they didn't go home where they belonged, when they didn't go back to the land that God had given them. Then that which they chose became a curse. 
and they became in bondage to everything that they, and then they got then they couldn't leave now this is certainly a picture of what happens to you and me when we first dally with the world it's so nice it's so comfortable and it's so enjoyable and we're just having such fun 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 don't talk to me about church don't talk to me about god i'll get around to that later i'm you know i gotta live a little live a little live a little that's the same people that clank in here with the long chains and shackles on oh oh could you help me oh i'm just dying i can't get rid of these things i hate them but i can't get rid of them and you know you look at those shackles and everyone i'm is stamped made by this person and put on voluntarily Ooh. And then you run across some that were put on that were not voluntary, but somebody opened the door and they got them in him. Now this is where you find the children of Israel 400 years later. It didn't take 400 years for things to change. They cried out for most of that time, Oh, help, help, we're in slavery. And God just waited. I wonder why he waited so long. I don't know. I wonder why he waits so long to answer our prayers. Would you dare to venture a guess? Are we so stubborn, hard-hearted, so fickle that he knows that we've got to rub our nose in the dirt a while before we'll appreciate getting out of it? Is it possible that he knows that we would be so foolish as to follow the enemy again in just short order? If it was easy to break those chains, you think Jesus couldn't break those chains? I had a letter from a, a poor, starry-eyed idiot this week. Bless his heart. He, he was really trying to help. He was going to help Pastor Worley. Bless his heart. He'd been a Christian a long time, he said, and he just started really trying to live for the Lord about three years ago, and then just a few months ago, he got interested in deliverance, and I was recently in a place, and he, he got some tremendous help, and then he learned that Pastor Worley had this terrible weight problem, and which, well, he didn't have to learn that. He could take a look, but, um, or if you don't believe I have, come up, and I'll stand on your foot a minute and let you see, but the... Uh, I know it's the strangest thing. Uh, people who notice this most of the time are, look like a, a yardstick. <laughs> you turn them sideways, you can hardly even see them, you know. And I look at them and think, wow, wouldn't it be nice to be like that? They look at me and say, wow, what a pig. You know, and uh, they actually seem to think that people with a weight problem like to be that way. Well, let me warn you about this. Don't have too much to say about it. You can develop a problem. Oh, I never have a, oh, 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 be careful. I've seen some people develop one. And then they said, oh, I don't understand it. Now all of a sudden I just can't get rid of it. I said, uh-huh. Who did you make fun of? Who did you ridicule who was having a weight problem? You never could, you, I don't understand. I don't understand. God said, help him understand. Be careful. Well, anyway, in the process, he had found out that the demons had stated there were some demons in my thyroid that were holding tight and that they would not give up and so forth and so on. And I've been prayed for by just about every deliverance worker I know of. And uh, they always come with starry eyes, they're going to do it. And I say, hell, pure self. So they come out. And then, uh, but he proceeded to tell me, you mustn't go around saying that Jesus can't cast them out. Why? And he lectured me on how Jesus just cast them out with a word. And I thought, oh, you poor little thing. Wait till you're in deliverance a while. And you see those that don't come out when you say come out. They turn and say, <laughs> make me. You see, we're just in the process of learning. There's a lot of things we don't know. Don't be too quick to think you know it all, you'll just make a fool of yourself. You say, have you answered the letter? No, I can't make it. I have to wait a while. If I answer it all, I have to wait a little while. I don't want to just tell him everything I think right now. <laughs> but, you know, you do get a little tired of people who know nothing telling you everything. Not that you can't learn from other people. You certainly can. But you can tell the tone by which they approach you. 
I've come to bless you, Pastor. Oh, I've been past letters. I've had people call me. Oh, the Lord told me to do this. And I said, all right. I listen, I listen. I thought, it seems to me I've heard this song before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've heard it over and over. I've heard it so many times. But I always try to give them credit for the fact they're trying to help. But if you fool around and you're caught in a demonic trap, you, it's not always as easy to get out as you think it is. And the, the, uh, the Israelites certainly didn't intend to get caught and become slaves. They had no intention to. I think there was an overnight change, practically. I don't think they had a chance to run for it. Here they were settled comfortably in the land of Goshen. They even had a special little section over there. I used to hear people say, land of Goshen. And I wondered what that was. And I got in the Bible, that's what it is. That was the place where they lived. Land of Goshen was a... And that's where they settled. But suddenly they lost their privileged position. And suddenly they looked at them and, uh-huh, here's two and a half million slaves. Well, good. Now we can build all our buildings, our roads, and build all the brick and everything else we need. And these slaves will do it free of charge. And so they, Egypt had the power to enforce that. And they, were, they suddenly woke up one morning. They, uh, I think they went to bed one night free and happy and had their own little fields, own little gardens, and happy days are here again. We're just doing fine. We're, did you see my new dress? You said, yes. Did you see my new robe? Wasn't that nice? New pair of sandals? Yes. Well, I have to get the kids something. The next morning, the soldiers were at the door. You are now slaves. It took them a while to realize how bad that was. Sometimes the devil lets us go along in our happy-go-lucky thing, and we don't really run into that much severe trouble. And then there comes a day when he asserts his dominion. Now remember, they're living in a bad, bad place. And now their condition has changed. They're no longer privileged citizens, but now they're under the bondage. And it comes out in the open, they're all slaves, and there's no hinting about it. It's just a matter of fact. They work from sun up to sundown. They are whipped when they don't do to suit their owners, and they are treated like animals. Well, they begin to, oh, oh I don't like it in Egypt anymore. I want to go home. I want to go home. Didn't Joseph say we were supposed to go back? Yes, his bones are over there in that house. That's right. And you know the greatest thing that Joseph did? It's recorded in Hebrews. When he died, he made a prophecy, someday you'll go back to the land. And he gave commandment concerning his bones and said, don't bury me in Egypt, but keep me, keep my body and take it back to the land. And his bones kept faith alive in Israel for 400 years. That's better than most preachers do. They have trouble keeping their own faith alive, let alone the whole nation. This one man, this tremendous man, he did wonderful things. But look in the book of Hebrews where God tells the most important thing that people did. And that's what's mentioned, that he gave commandment concerning his bones and that they were going back to Egypt, going out of Egypt. And this kept them alive. But they cried and they moaned and they didn't want to be in Egypt. And generations came and generations went. And still they were in bondage. And yet the bones of Joseph kept a flicker of faith alive. In those terrible conditions, they're in bondage and slavery. Now then God raises up a deliverer after 400 years. He, he goes to Moses, gets him out, of the, out in the desert. Well, Moses was heading that way earlier, 40 years before he was heading that way. Uh, but he blew it. Uh, he popped his cork. Did you ever do that? He came marching in, saw this Egyptian overseer beating this Hebrew slave. He said, we'll not do that. He grabbed the thing away from him. He hauled off and whopped him on the head and he gave him a pretty good lick. I guess killed him. And then all of a sudden the Egyptian law turned against him who had been raised as the son of the Pharaoh. And he had to flee for his life because even he could not commit murder. So he fled to the desert, backside of the desert. 
because he lost his patience, he, was, he couldn't wait for God to work it out. And let me repeat that. I think somebody missed that. He couldn't wait for God to work out the deliverance. Uh, one more time. He could not wait for God to work out the deliverance. He grabbed hold and decided he'd do it. The way to get deliverance is bop him on the head. So he, he let him have it. So what happened? Deliverance was delayed for 40 years. You say, oh my Lord, what have I done? <laughs> well, just add 40 years, you know, and then pray the Lord will be merciful and, and shrink it a little bit if you've done something very foolish. Don't grab hold and try to direct God's deliverance. Just flow with it. Find out where the deliverance channel is going and then flow with it and let God direct it. You'll be surprised. You'll come loose a lot quicker than you think. One reason some people are delayed in deliverance is because they're so determined to get delivered and they want deliverance on their terms. We have people every once in a while pop around here. They come in here, you know, well, this is the headquarters. Okay, I'm here. I want to be delivered. And they sit down and somebody prays with them. And they, huh. Well, nothing happened with them. Hmm. So they browse around and here they get another one. And people go through three workers in one session. Did they get any deliverance? Absolutely not. You don't get it that way. Just switching workers is not going to be enough. You've got to be ready. And you've got to ferret out those nasty little things that keep you from getting those shackles off of you. In Exodus 5, uh, Pharaoh, uh, Moses goes into Pharaoh and tells the Pharaoh that God has said to let the people go to have a feast in the wilderness. Notice this arrogance coming through. And who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. What are you talking? How dare you? Who is this God that's giving me orders? I give the orders. I don't know this Lord you're talking about, and I will not let the people go. Well, that's what he thinks. When God gets through with him, he's going to say, take them, get out, hurry, run, do not walk, get gone. But it takes a while because God beats the living hound out of him and the whole country. And they're crying to get God off their back before it's over. Well, and they said, uh, well, the God of Israel, the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us go, we pray you, three days' journey in the, de in the desert. Sacrifice the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. And the Pharaoh says to him, wherefore do you, Moses and Aaron, let the, your people from the earth get you to your burdens? He said, what do you mean having these people gather up here, having a rally here? They should be working. What do you mean interrupting the labor force here? And uh, Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmaster of the people and their officers, you shall give, uh, no more give people straw to make brick. As heretofore, let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail of the bricks, which they did make uh, heretofore, you shall lay on them. They shall not diminish one ought if they be idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and sacrifice. So they've got so much time, they can sit around and talk about go worship their God. Before we furnish the straw for them to make those mud bricks, now they have to go get the straw themselves, and they have to have produce the same amount of bricks they did before. He said, I'll teach them to sit around and whine about wanting to go worship. They've got too much time on their hands. That's what's the matter with them. Let more work be laid upon the men that they, be, uh, that they labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. He said, they're listening to their stupid Moses. They're listening to vain words. They won't have time if they're tired enough. They'll be too tired to worry about it. So the taskmasters go out. The officers, they spoke to the people, said, Pharaoh says, I won't give you straw. Go get it wherever you can get it. And yet your work must not be diminished. You've got to produce the same amount of straw. Now, let me tell you something. When you start moving toward deliverance, 
And you have some Moses sit down before you and say, come out of them in Jesus' name. They don't want to be bound anymore. You know what's going to happen? Pharaoh, and who did I say he represents? He's the king, sun god. The devil's going to say, stir up. And every demon you've got is going to stir up. We've actually had people pop in here and they go in and say, they put demons in me. I wasn't having any trouble until I got prayer over there. <laughs> well, I beg your pardon. They came in saying they didn't think anything happened, but it did. They stirred up those waters and the demons are mm -hmm. And all those monsters have been laying eye, but quietly by and just letting them pass. They start chewing on them. And they said, well, the very idea, we'll teach you to run around here going to church and going over to Hagwish. We'll make you miserable. We'll blow up everything you got. And boy, they go to work. Anybody ever experienced that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Telling the truth. That's why we tell people now, if, don't start out in deliverance unless you plan to follow through. Because you'll be sorry. <laughs> Not because it won't work. But because once you start, you better keep going. It's, uh, you know, did you ever get on a real muddy road? And uh, you're going down in your car, and they said, now don't slow down. If you slow down, if you ever stop, you'll never get started again. If you ever stop, you know, and then you go, zing, zing. If you want some slick roads, go out to visit Ray Wishman in Montana. They got the slickest one. I'll tell you, I had so much faith when I came back from Montana after going through the... <laughs> we went down that road sideways. I'm not exaggerating. That, I didn't ever know a car could go sideways down the road, but it can. It just goes zoom. And he said, I'm just calm as ever, Judge. I was a praying up a storm. I think he did it on purpose trying to frighten me. I was holding my side down, but his side was sliding around. <laughs> I did. Oh, and I got to the airport and I said, thank you, Lord, for these great big jets because all they can do is fall out of the air. <laughs> At least they don't scare you to death while they're waiting, while you're waiting, you know. But you know how it is. If you start out and you stop, you're dead. You'll never get started again because you can't get your, you can't get your pulling wheels going again. And so that's kind of like it is in deliverance. Don't stop. Or if you do, you better pray that some deliverance workers with some long chains and throw a hook on you and pull and help get you going again because you've got to keep going. The demons will definitely stir up. Just like the Pharaoh stirred up here. And he stirred them up and put the taskmaster who made their task worse. And whereas they were suffering before, all of a sudden the suffering increases, the torment gets worse. And a lot of times people think we're joking when we say, now when you first start out, it's going to get worse. And they think, but I came to get better. Well, you will get better, but first you've got to get worse, you know. Cheer up, the worst is yet to come. I cheered up and sure enough, it, it did. The worst came on. And, but you can't say we didn't warn you. It's just because you're stirring up the enemy and he's making a determined effort to get you away from deliverance. Why, well, some of you have had that experience when you picked up the books. Do you ever have trouble reading the books? Have trouble listening to the tape? Couldn't even listen to it or couldn't hear it? Some people told me they, they'd pick up the book and their, their mind would just go blank or they'd get all disturbed and upset they couldn't even read the thing. I know uh, one time young lady who came here for prayer, she, <laughs> she, she, uh, it was Brenda, Danny, she told, she told me when she came here, she said, I'm going to kill Fred. Said he walks up and says, you're going over to visit Hegwish, you better read this. And so he handed her about it in the hotel. Said, he didn't tell me a thing about it. He just handed me the book. She said, oh, okay. And she said, I'd sit down to read the book and then I'd get violently ill and I'd run to the bathroom. I thought, oh my, I have to hurry. <gasps> and nothing would come up. <laughs> and she said, after I'd heave a while, I'd feel better. And I think, well. And I go back and I start reading again. The next thing I know, here I'm running desperately. Oh, oh. <laughs> and 
and nothing came out. And so this happened over and over again. And I finally got far enough in the book, I found out what was happening. <laughs> said, I'm going to kill Fred. He said, he didn't warn me about that. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, you see, the enemy gets very stirred up and disturbed when you begin to move into the area. The only area that he's afraid of, people, is the power of Jesus Christ. The early church swept through a world that was absolutely controlled and sold out to witchcraft. It was completely controlled, motivated, moved every part of the economic system, the government, the religion, everything from top to bottom, sideways, vertically, horizontally, any way you want to slice it was controlled by the devil. And the infant church started out with people who hadn't had time to go to a Bible school because they hadn't had time to build one. Didn't need it anyway. But they, uh, they began to pray for each other and then they branched. And they swept across that heathen world filled with witchcraft and darkness and they flattened the enemy everywhere they went. They tore it up. When two men entered one of the big cities of the Roman Empire, people went, some people went raving to the magistrates and said, those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Two men coming into town. And they were screaming their heads off. It was dangerous. These two men had come. Two. Oh, oh, these terrible two men have arrived. Two. Anybody got upset about you coming besides your relatives lately? <laughs> what am I talking about? Deliverance was an integral, vital part of the early church. It was like the cow catcher on a train. You know what cow catchers are for? If they hit a cow, it rakes them off. It doesn't run over them. It just rakes them off to one side. It knocks everything off the tracks ahead of that train. And you see, the enemy got the train streamlined some time ago and took that old cow catcher off and threw it back in the back cars and said, you won't be needing this anymore. In our modern world, all you need is evangelism and healings and supernatural wonders. And if you can put on a little charismatic circus now and then to entertain the people. Somebody brought me an ad about how you could ride, ride off to Christ for the Nations and get a, what, $35? You get a course in how to play the tambourine, really you know, liven things up. I could hardly wait to get my envelope in the mail. <laughs> I was sure those tambourines would drive the demons de crazy. Oh, listen, people, it's time we woke up. The power of God, the resurrection power, the power of the blood of Jesus is all vested in that delivering power. Without deliverance, the results of evangelism will be lost and have been lost for years. We've lost the greatest uh, harvest of benefits from evangelism. The people have been saved. Hallelujah for that. Yes, they've been born again. Thank God. But the power of God has not fallen because deliverance has not been available to those saved people so they could be cleaned up and then branch out and attack the enemy full speed ahead. And it's still so. You say, well, I don't, where are all the deliverance churches? I wish I knew. I can spot a few of them, not many. But I'll tell you what, you say, well, if there's not very many, there must be something wrong with it. There is. The devil doesn't like it. And he has hornswoggled practically everybody into believing his lie. My Christians can't have demons. What do you mean? You think I'm demon possessed? I almost feel like saying yes, <laughs> because they're so near possession till they almost get there. Oh, listen, people, we've got to come to the place where deliverance again assumes that dynamite force in the front that blows the enemy off the tracks and evangelism will come through and thousands upon thousands of souls will be saved and hundreds of miracles and signs and wonders will follow. But deliverance is a thing that breaks the yoke of the enemy. 
the Pharaoh was stirred up when God's messenger came and announced that God wanted his people out of there. And every time you come in contact with deliverance books, a deliverance group, a deliverance church, you are going to, he's going to make you pay for it. You say, well, I'm going to back out. I'm afraid it's a little late now. You've touched base now. And he will never forgive you for coming here. See, what we've got is contagious. It's, catch, it's like the measles. It's catching as long as you got fever with it. And we're pretty feverish about deliverance. We believe it. We've seen so much. Don't try to, don't try to wake us up and show us a better way, a sweeter, nicer way to do it. A more effective way that can get them out faster and better? You bet. But the kind where you just cover it up like a cat box, forget it. <laughs> we want to empty the box, not cover it up. There's been too much cover up. It's time to rip the covers off and get the stink out in the open and deal with it. And deliverance is the power based on the resurrection power of Jesus, based on the power of his blood. And of course, that's the same thing that got you saved. So you should be familiar with it. You just haven't seen this aspect of it maybe as fully as you should. What can we do? We can bind and loose. We can pray. I personally believe there's so much pressure on deliverance works everywhere. This one and everyone I know of, every deliverance worker I know of, is being pressured with an unbelievable amount of pressure for the last few months. As I prayed about it, the Lord seemed to impress me. You're on the verge of another ma major breakthrough in deliverance. And the enemy knows it and he is furious. I think it's going to be something on the magnitude of the fragmented soul or sins of the fathers. And God is figuring we're just about ready to have it. He's trying to get us ready. Don't conk out people. Hang in there. Because I think the fireworks are going to be worth seeing. And it's going to do just like these other breakthroughs God has given us. It's going to open the door for many more people to be set free. And many of the people who've already experienced deliverance to go much deeper in deliverance. Uh, the deliverance they've desired but not been able to get as yet. I know you're not supposed to have manifestations because that does upset the demons, something fierce. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> it upsets the church folks. Well, same thing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not really the people that are getting upset. The reason they get so upset, they never stop to analyze, why am I so upset? Why am I upset when the demon is saying, leave me alone, leave me alone? Why don't I say hallelujah? That nasty thing is finally on the run. Why am I so upset and saying this is undignified? You know, not to be in the church. <laughs> they should have at least the decency to put it in the back room where nobody can see it. Oh, the devil loves that when you stick it off in the back room. But there's not a scripture anywhere for doing that. The shackles of Egypt will come off only when you have somebody who will stick to the job. Did Moses stick to the job? He sure did. And he went to work on Pharaoh, and he, he, he works him out. They, they, uh, Pharaoh got worse, and God promised him he would attack, and he did. Now, you know, the people got mad at Moses because of the terrible bondage. They said, go away. Ever since we've known anything about you, you've just caused trouble. Just get away and leave us alone. Did he go away? No, he didn't. I'm not going to go away either. I plan to stay on the scene as long as God gives me breath. I'm going to be telling people that you can be delivered. And it doesn't matter how many people haven't been delivered, how many people don't have, have spirits, you don't have to live under the bondage of them. You can whip them right where they stand. And if they won't leave, then the good thing to do is just thrash the daylights out of them until they're perfectly miserable and say, you go when I tell you to. Now you sit down on there and be quiet. Did you know that's one reason God delays deliverance? He wants us to learn that we have the authority over those nasty things and that they don't have to dominate. They don't have to control us. They don't have to throw our minds into tailspins. They don't have to do all these things. If we learn how to take authority over them while they're inside, we'll never fear them from the outside. One reason that I guess, uh, you know, a lot of people, they get upset with me because I, I tell the demons, well, why don't you kill me? You know, and they say, ah, ah, don't speak such terrible things. What terrible things? 
My life's in the hands of my God. They can't do a thing in the world unless God says, all right. Besides that, <laughs> they're a tiger in a cage. I've already measured how long their claw is, and I stay just out of reach. <laughs> they can reach out, ow, ow. <laughs> I just say, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, you missed me. You know, well, I'm entitled to do that. Listen, we don't have to be afraid. And God is teaching us in this interim period. This is an interim period of deliverance. We haven't even seen the glory part yet. I don't know. The nation may have to fall apart. The world may have to explode before it happens. I don't know. But I believe there's a future for deliverance. And we're going to see the glory of God like a fireball coming down and individual believers that have hung on and been faithful, God is going to show them. And they're not going to start around and say, look at me, am I not wonderful? Let me sprinkle the radiance on you as I go past. They're not even going to be conscious of it. They'll do what they're supposed to do. Their work is to destroy the works of the devil. And they'll just be busy doing that and it won't even occur to them. There's anything wrong with it. You can pray about those ABC cameras that are supposed to come in here tomorrow. They're going to have a one sweet time getting here. They're coming in from Minneapolis. And uh, it could be an opening to fling deliverance before the whole country. If that ABC program in Minneapolis gets hold of something good, they'll share it and it can flash across the country. You say, I don't want my picture on there. Well, then you better, not, you better get on the bottom row, bottom floor. Or if you hit the floor, you better turn over. <laughs> Who cares, people? If somebody back home says, I saw you on the TV. Just say, yeah, I was getting deliverance. Would you like some? Watch them run. <laughs> Like I said, I don't know whether anything will come of this or not. You never know. I will invite them to stay for the song sermon because I'm sure they're not going to be prepared for what's going to happen tomorrow night. Like some of you are not going to be prepared either, but it's going to happen anyhow. And, and then Sunday morning we're going to have a concert. I'm going to sing a concert. So, so that everybody can go home happy, happy, happy. And I've got all the, the, the concert is called, I Love You, Lord Jesus. Now, that, that shouldn't upset any demon, should it? I keep trying. I switch around and switch themes. And the last one was one of the worst. I sung on heaven. I thought, sure, they would enjoy hearing about that. But they didn't like that either. <laughs> the enemy will get worse, but God will get greater. You see, it was when Pharaoh did his worst that God moved in and struck him with the plagues. So hang in there, battered saint. One that's just about to give up and hang it up and say, oh, forget it. I just can't handle it. It's just too much. And I know some of you, you're going through hell itself. But you see, you go back and check the saints. Go check Paul's record and see if you can match his. I was feeling very sorry for myself one time. I hardly ever do that. But uh, once uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was sitting in a motel room and I thought, this is just terrible. Why should I have to do all this? And the devil said, that's right. I don't blame you. Nobody appreciates what you're doing. I said, that's right. This was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> And the Lord said, I'd suggest you check your record against Paul's. Now, what do you want to do like that for? Did you ever read his record? I said, thank you, Lord, for my glorious, per uh, uh, nice air-conditioned room. I don't remember Paul ever had one. Thank you, Lord. They hadn't whipped me yet. They've looked like they wanted to, but they haven't done it yet. <laughs> Haven't been shipwrecked yet. And there's so many things I haven't been, I haven't been run out of town yet. Maybe I didn't stay long enough, I don't know. But, 
and above all, I haven't been let down over the wall in a basket. That just, that gives me creeps. I have fervently, <laughs> I have fervently prayed the Lord would never send me to a wall city. <laughs> Because, you know, you never know. History repeats itself. And, and <laughs> if, I, if things were so stirred up that I couldn't get out the gates and the disciples had to lower me over the wall in a basket, in the first place they'd have to find one big enough. <laughs> and in the second place, if they didn't have a drag line, well, I'd be afraid I'd drag all the disciples with me when they were <laughs> we went over the wall. <laughs> Those are just some fears I haven't gotten rid of yet. <laughs> People, we've got to be ready to face hardships for Jesus. Didn't he face a lot for us? He didn't stop. He went all the way to Calvary. He could have detoured, but he knew the shackles of Egypt would never come off unless that resurrection victory gave us power beyond description or understanding. He knew that you and I would remain bound all our lives. We'd never know the joy of salvation. We'd never know about freedom, hope, joy, any of those glorious things. And so what did he do? He stuck it out all the way. Despised the shame. Did not enjoy the pain at all. But he had his eye on you and me. And he knew that way down here in the 1980s, there'd be a group of people who desperately need help. And there wouldn't be any help if he didn't pay the price. Do you ever thank God for those 11 apostles that stuck? On their shoulders, the infant church was resting. Their leadership spun off all these others. And Paul, that magnificent man of God, oh my, he scares the daylights out of me. He made mistakes, but he made so few. I'm not like that. And Moses, oh Lord, he scares me to death too. What a man. He made some mistakes, but not very many. But then you have David. Oh, he could make the biggest mess and be the sorriest of it. Now you're trading on my tracks. He could mess up and just be so sorry for it and God would take him back and still use him. Peter, oh my lands, off and on like a neon sign. <laughs> now you see him, now you don't. And before God got a hold of him just right, he wasn't worth shooting hardly. But afterwards, you see, he could, make the, he could make a big mess and be sorry for it too. And he was used. Isn't that encouraging? I love to look at all those people that made it through and that got a hold of a goal that was worth more than life. See, nowadays, We've got goals of building buildings, building cities, building little doodankles and little uh, learning how to recreate and entertain ourselves. And this is necessary because we are religious and we have these great psychological needs. But you know, Jesus talked about bearing a cross and everybody that followed him did the same thing. As I read through the biographies of the saints down through the years, the ones who made the mark on the world were those who caught sight of Calvary, fell in love with Jesus, and were just ruined for the rest of their life. It's a little chorus that says, I fell in love with Jesus at the cross of Calvary. Have you fallen in love with him? I hope you will. He'll set you free. The shackles of Egypt are terrible. They're forged by the enemy. They're meant to hold you for life until you die. The devil intends for you to die with the shackles on. He doesn't want you to be free ever. But Jesus purposed for you and me to be free. And if we'll stick to it, 
he'll show us how to get free. Do you believe that? Aren't you glad? Don't you just love him a little bit better? Because he loved us so much. The shackles of Egypt are strong. The Pharaoh is all powerful in the world. But there's one intervening from out of this world who overcomes every foe. Our business is to learn how to go with him. If Moses had given up when the people turned on him, some of you had the people turn on you that you helped, that you were trying to help. You've had them say, get out. Things are worse. Why don't you just leave us alone? Moses had that happen to him. It's over in the sixth chapter. And the ninth verse, the children of Israel, they said, leave us alone. The bondage is worse. We don't want to hear anymore. Just don't bother us. Let us go. We don't want to talk to you anymore. But you know what? Moses didn't say, well, I'm going to go and suck my thumb because nobody loves me. And I took a popularity poll and I was at the bottom of the preachers. Nobody wanted me to be the preacher. No, he had a commission from God and he was determined to please God whether anybody understood it, liked it, or anything else. And he saw through the plagues of Egypt and he was the one who saw the mighty hand of God and God continued to talk to him. If you want God to speak with you, if you want God to march with you, it's because you've committed yourself to him. Oh, I know the shackles of Egypt are hard to get rid of, but God is aware of all of those. And if you'll keep praying and keep reminding God, I want free, I want free, and I don't want free so I can go out and play and act fool. I want free so I can serve Jesus. If you'll do that, people. He said, take up your cross. That's an instrument of death. How many times must I remind you? It's not a little ornament of delight. It's an instrument of death. There's only one purpose for a cross, and that's to kill you. And Jesus said to take it up. That implies you do it because that's what you determined to do. And it'll kill off everything of you and leave only Jesus showing. Ooh. You mean I can't show? If you do, people, you'll fail. You want to the extent that people are caught up in us and our personality and our cleverness and our are this and that and the other, and we failed. To the extent that they forget about us and they remember the thing that Jesus did through us, the gifts that operated, the message that came, the prayer that came, the deliverances. When they begin to remember Jesus more than they remember you, you can know you're making tracks. You say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. They're giving, great, they're giving thanks to Jesus. That's the way it ought to be. And there's coming a time when he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant.